Obviously, we're entering very perilous times, and it's in everyone's best interest to try to become as self-sufficient as possible, because the infrastructure is likely to crumble, or it's going to be denied to entire groups and blocks of people for political reasons. We're going to see economic warfare going on, even if we don't see civil war. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for March 14th through March 21st, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature the Silver Krugerrand at $3.79 over spot. For years, the Krugerrand was the most known bullion coin in the world. And in 2017, the South African Mint and Rand Refinery began minting a silver counterpart to the famed Gold Krugerrand. The Silver Krugerrand bear the Springbok on one side and the portrait of Paul Kruger on the other and have a face value of one rand. They come 25 to a tube, 500 to a monster box, they are IRA eligible, and are renowned for recognizability and design. Best of all, they are only $3.79 over spot while supplies last. To order this special or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this long-followed guest. James Rawls is the founder of survivalblog.com. It's one of the oldest and most widely followed resources for everything you need to know about preparedness from food, shelter, weaponry, precious metals, water, community networking, and on and on and on. James, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Thanks for having me on. I wanted to mention to everyone today, we're recording this, is Monday, March 6, 2023, and we'll be posting this later this week, so uh, happy to have you on. It's been a while, and I often get inquiries from people who are saying, hey, you used to be called Reluctant Preppers, and you talked more about preparedness, and uh, where can I go to learn more about preparedness? And I do refer them to some of our old playlists. Uh, We have some called like Home Sweet Prepared Home and things like that that talk about specific topics of physical preparedness. But I also direct them to survivalblog.com because that's just an encyclopedia of information. And uh, I know that you stand ready to help give people specific uh, answers to specific questions, although most of that you got cataloged on your site. One of the things before I guess before we move on, I had a very specific question for you, but I want to give you a chance if there's anything on that topic of preparedness information resource that you'd like to throw in there? Well, I do recommend that people do dive into the archives at survivalblog.com. And the the amount of knowledge that's there goes far beyond my own. Because if you look at the way that Survival Blog is structured, uh, because of the writing contests that we've run for so many years, the majority of what's uh, gone on in the blog in the last eight years has actually been written by the readers of the blog, not me. And they're all sharing their knowledge. The amount of uh, information that's there, the, the depth and breadth of knowledge is just amazing. And I highly recommend that people dive in, dig into those archives. They're, it's all available free of charge. There's no subscription required, no secret members only area. It's all there. They're free for the taking. Beyond uh, looking back for basic information, the other thing that you introduced to us and to our viewers a while back in an interview, in fact, the interview was entitled, We Are Living in the Age of Deception and Betrayal, Plan Accordingly, Invest Accordingly, Relocate Accordingly. And that statement of yours about we are living in the age of deception and betrayal has just been pounding in my mind since then. And I've brought it up in, I think, at least a half a dozen, maybe a dozen interviews on other topics with guests. It seems to be so so uh, pervasively true in the society that we find ourselves and the times that we find ourselves both uh, regionally, nationally, internationally, 
And I wanted to pick your brain for the benefit of our viewers. If there's any new awarenesses on that theme that press themselves to your mind that have come to the light uh, since we first talked about that, especially recently, that you think people who are preparedness-minded need to be aware of so that they can be better prepared to survive and thrive in the times that we're in and the times we're heading into? Well, when I first uh, used that phrase in an interview with you, I believe that was actually before the Biden administration came in. And what we've seen from the Bidenistas is deception and betrayal on a grand scale. Where uh, there are so many things that they are promulgating uh, by executive order and uh, and rolling out within their agencies, most notably the FBI and the ATF, that really play into that theme. Uh, the ATF has really gone on a rampage uh, in a number of different areas, most notably redefining what constitutes a frame and receiver, a frame or receiver, uh, changing their mind for, for the third or now fourth time about uh, pistols with stabilizing braces. And then also um, all of their uh, shenanigans about um, whether or not someone can make their own firearm. You know, America has a long history of homemade firearms. And at the time of the signing of uh, the Declaration of Independence, and, and certainly in uh, 1789, when the Constitution came around, the majority of firearms in America were actually homemade. And here we have a federal agency that's claiming that um, you can't make a firearm at home uh, from an 80% complete block of metal. It's absolutely absurd. There's, If you look at the uh, recent Bruin decision that came out of, the, out of the Supreme Court, there is no history, text, or tradition at all dating to uh, 1789 or earlier that restricted people making their own firearms. In fact, that was that was the majority of guns that were being made. So for them to now try to redefine that uh, in any sort of way is is absolutely unconstitutional. Meanwhile, we've got the FBI that has been proven to be in cahoots with some of the major uh, tech companies. Uh, in the social media sphere, conspiring to deprive people of their freedom of speech with overt censorship. These are this is a federal agency expending U.S. taxpayer funds to pay for censorship. This is censorship they couldn't do themselves because of constitutional restrictions, but. They somehow feel that it's acceptable uh, to to do it um, through a third party. It's absolutely absurd. So that's just another example of the deception and betrayal that I was originally alluding to. It's getting more overt and it's becoming more commonplace. And people are waking up to what's going on, but all around us that the walls are really closing in. We've got more and more of power being centralized in the federal government. And the, the government has basically forgotten who they work for. They're working for us, supposedly. Uh, but they're looking at us as the enemy. And they're literally conspiring against us in so many ways. So I think people need to recognize that we no longer have a representative government. We no longer have federal agencies that are accountable uh, to the American people or to the Constitution. They basically run amok. So I, I recommend that people redouble their efforts politically um, Try do their very best to um, stop what's going on. But at this point, 
uh, we're practically at the plan B stage. And I think that um, Marjorie Taylor Greene may have the right idea. Two more glaring things, elephants in the room uh, in terms of things that are full of deception and betrayal that we've all been living through. And I will have to speak sort of circumspectly around one of them, and that is uh, safe and effective. We're every day almost now we're finding out from both na uh, domestic and international scientific peer-reviewed studies that the solution that we were being forced to pay for, uh, many forced to accept, some say in violation of the Geneva Convention, etc., was neither safe nor effective, and we're finding out more and more how unsafe or how ineffective. Um, the other one is what we've talked about with John Williams from shadowstats.com in terms of financial statistics, headline statistics about the health or ill health of our financial world, our our fiat currency, our federal government, et cetera. Do you want to touch base on either one of those? And again, we have to be um, we have to be subtle talking about the first one. Well, financially, uh, it's very clear that um, we, we've been uh, led astray by the, the Federal Reserve, by the U.S. Treasury Department, and by the decisions of the, um, the Biden administration. The, the whole war on inflation is really a farce. And meanwhile, we've got... Um, the, the default of Blackstone with commercial mortgage-backed securities has just taken place. And I think that that is just really the opening stage of a, a major route in both commercial and residential real estate. We're going to see a huge decline in real estate prices and what troubles me even more than having people's net worth uh, deeply, deeply degraded, we're also probably going to see a bailout because as these derivatives blow up, if you look at the, the history of what happened um, you know, back in 2007, we're likely to see a bailout of huge proportions, and the taxpayers are once again going to be on the hook. The There's very likely to be a derivatives crisis with everything that's real estate oriented, whether it's um, CMBSs, whether it's um, REITs, which is uh, real estate investment trusts, um, there's collateralized loan obligations, CLOs. All of those are at risk right now. What we saw, what happened with Blackstone, I think, is just the, really the beginning. And it really didn't take that much of a drop in the real estate market to trigger that. When real estate drops seriously, then these derivatives are, are going to completely fall apart because we're going to have missing counterparties. Yeah, that's one of the things that has been pointed out about derivatives. And I know that uh, Bill Holter, whom we interview periodically on that topic, says, what's the value of a contract that can't perform? And he always, after a pause, answers the value of zero, is that people are forgetting it isn't simply a matter of, oh, this, the real estate market's dropped by whatever percent, and then they'll, they'll recover someday. The idea is that since so many very large financial players have placed bets against or, f or for the market, requiring the market to maintain its strength, that when those go upside down, um, in fact, you can end up with counterparties that go upside down and actually get wiped out. Exactly. Yeah, the, the counterparty risk is huge. Um, now, in a perfect world and in an up market, derivatives work wonderfully. They do offset risk. Uh, they make a lot of money for a lot of people. But in a down market where there's great uncertainty and chaos is thrown into the mix, then uh, you could literally have a, a counterparty who's just left twisting in the breeze. If, if the other side of that trade disappears for any number of different reasons, whether it's regulatory, 
the business environment, or in the case of uh, Sam Bankman Freed, someone absconding with funds, the risk is huge. And the other one uh, we mentioned there was uh, about uh, safe and effective. Is there anything that you think people that are concerned about preparedness and their family's welfare and well-being need to be aware of in that realm? Well, I guess rule number one is don't trust what the government says. Don't trust the science because they've, they've shown repeatedly that they keep changing the science. So obviously we can't trust the science. And obviously the, um, the people who are promulgating these policies, whether it's max masking or vaccination or distancing or lockdowns or whatever, don't have our best interest at heart. And we've got to recognize that. And at some point, we have to basically step away from that whole milieu and set up um, alternative trade methods, alternative ways of getting together physically that um, might violate some of the, the guidelines or the rules that they put out. Because people still need to make a living. They still need to eat. They still need to feed their children. And if they put us in another situation like they did two years ago, this next go around, uh, who knows how severe it might be, really have to, to team up with our neighbors and be ready to trade amongst ourselves because we may be in a situation where we literally cannot go to town shopping at all. We'll be locked down, completely locked down to the point of starvation. Which we've seen happen. Uh, our good uh, friend, John Adams, economist from Australia, what, they were under lockdowns there where you were not allowed to go out into your front yard. You could you could go out into your backyard, but not your front yard, that kind of thing, which really makes it, uh, as you say, how are you supposed to get food, that sort of thing, unless you have an extensive garden, which many don't, who live in, in uh, uh, not only the country, that sort of thing. Um, these other structures, we've had Joel Salatin on uh, Teaching Farmer from Polyface Farms talking about his book called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, and uh, it talks about how you need to be able to call things something else if you want to sometimes get around ridiculous regulations. Are there any examples of that strategy in preparedness that come to mind? Yeah, a prime example of that is for anyone who has dairy animals, whether they're uh, goats or milking sheep or cattle. Um, obviously, if they're going to clamp down on that, we need to be able to continue to, to trade amongst ourselves and calling that milk animal feed rather than milk for human consumption is really the key. Oh, it, people need to just think in different terms, get used to a whole new vocabulary of doing business so that they can continue to thrive, even though the government is doing their very best to shut us down. Yeah. Uh, Joel Salton relayed a story of a people who are living in, whether it's uh, suburban environments or even townships or whatever, who have restrictions against, for example, farm an raising farm animals. Uh, and uh, and the uh, one of the workarounds that was discovered by some in, on, inter enterprising and entrepreneurial uh, acquaintances of his were to have visiting chickens. So there was a lady who, who runs a business where she doesn't sell you chickens, she just has them come for a visit. And so for <laughs> an unspecified period of time, they're, you're, they're just visiting. So you're not, you're, not, you're not owning them, you don't own them, she owns them, right. but, but they're just visiting. Yep. There's some dairy farmers who uh, get around some of the dairy restrictions by selling shares of their cattle or selling uh, selling entire cows to, say, a group of neighbors. And what's, what's produced by that cow is their property, not the farmer's property. So he can't be accused of selling anything. Because how can you sell something that doesn't belong to you? Right. And there's also the model of private clubs 
where you establish a private club and in the bylaws it says everybody has to pay for their membership and then they receive certain certain um, benefits for being private members of the club and that can include things like agricultural goods or that sort of thing so there's there are various approaches other than the simple um, sort of retail commercial model that people are familiar with that tends to get attacked uh, by the authorities um, not to say that you know you zig they zag you, you eventually these workarounds find counter workarounds from the tax code and so on but um, it's it's at least heartwarming to see basically persistent uh, authentic nonviolent um, uh, creativity on the part of people that are just trying to live normal lives in a very abnormal situation uh, any further thoughts on that before I ask one more zinger based on what you were talking about earlier no I think we basically covered that but I do encourage uh, your listeners to dive into uh, especially local farmers markets get to know the folks that are there Find out who's producing food locally. Make those personal contacts, develop those relationships, because they may be crucial in the years to come. That's one of the lessons uh, that we've heard echoing and echoing throughout the years is it's not just waking up unto yourself and taking a few steps of purchasing some things, some whether it's tools or, or hoarding some uh supplies and that sort of thing but it's it's the power of networking with like-minded people who can help each other the power of the group that are cooperating with each other truly does grow exponentially it's not just one plus one equals two it's much much more powerful than that so absolutely and and uh please don't think of this as communism folks it's not it's capitalism on the smallest and most appropriate scale now, I want to circle back to something you mentioned in passing earlier. You you've, you mentioned about the government or, or people who are in the decision-making power. You said the, the science keeps changing. Well, first of all, I wanted to interject maybe a different way of saying that because with a background in both from degrees as well as profession in the past of science and engineering, I would say, no, yes, science, the scientific method doesn't change, but the conclusions that are reached, the, the limit of our knowledge is always changing. That's, that's how the process works is you, you challenge and you challenge and you challenge and you test against observable reality and you bring together the best observations and you, and you get, you get input, you get feedback. And that's what peer reviewing is all about. All that, that is, that is what science is. And you can say in that regard, it's always changing, but uh, what but became so chilling in the last few years was this sort of announced policy statements or position statements which had to be rigidly defended and in the name of science i know when we've interviewed constitutional attorney edwin dr edwin vieira he talks about governments getting away with things quote unquote in the color under the color of law so they'll use the pageantry the ceremony the titles the uniforms the the tools the threats that are appropriate to legitimate law but they'll apply them completely illegitimately and unconstitutionally but they'll get away with it with in with most people until people kind of wake up and start pushing back because they're doing it under the color of law and this is sort of like under the color of science a lot of what we were exposed to was absolutely not scientific in fact science those who were devoted to true science were being crushed their reputations destroyed their careers ended their appointments canceled and their their honorary titles withdrawn and even getting written out of wikipedia in in the history uh of what was actually their accomplishments in the past so any comments from you on that principle of things being done in the name of science or in the name of patriotism or that sort of thing where it's really the opposite of what's going on well again we're living in the age of deception and betrayal and we can expect bureaucrats to claim authority based on science based on their positions uh their their elected or their appointed positions based on pretty flags or um, uh, patriotism or whatever, we've reached the point where we've got to stop implicitly trusting anyone who's in a position of authority unless they can absolutely point to a constitutional justification for what they're doing. If they cannot articulate that, it's just like a, a police officer 
has to have an, uh, an articulable probable cause to make an arrest. Well, a, a politician or a bureaucrat needs to have an articulable reference to the Constitution for each and every action they take. Otherwise, it's not constitutional. And per Marbury v. Madison, any law that's unconstitutional is null and void. This is where I wanted to get back to. And that is, you mentioned earlier, they forgot the governments of the leaders. They forgot who they work for. I've heard it said in the last uh, couple of months, and it, it really stuck with me, kind of haunted me since the proposition that people who are constitutional conservatives or libertarians are working at a distinct disadvantage in these times because we're following the playbook of the Constitution. We're acting as though we are dealing with a constitutional republic and as though by staying within the boundaries and the um, uh, expectations of the roles of, ev of everyone who's, who, who is, you know, whether it's government, um, whether it's uh, car corporations, whether it's individuals, etc., they're all acting within the Constitution, and, and we object. We try to do those. We try to appeal up through the legislature. We try to vote people out or vote people in or, or hope that the, the Supreme Court or whoever will take up this case that's going to make everything get set back right upside, you know, from upside down to right side up again. But the, the complaint was that we are misled we are we are deluded we are acting in not in accord with reality in other words that the opponent this threat both foreign and domestic that we're facing is not following that playbook and hasn't been following it for some time and and as even though they're still wearing the suits and ties and everything they're not following the playbook and and so that we're at a distinct disadvantage by limiting ourselves to the same uh i know there's pitfalls because when people think oh well I'll, we'll just temporarily go outside the, the boundaries of the Constitution or whatever because urgent times call for urgent actions or whatever. Um, again, Dr. Edwin Vieira, a constitutional attorney, says, well, that's when you get you have to call upon sometimes a higher law than the Constitution. That's the Declaration of Independence. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that idea of constitutional conservatives putting themselves at a disadvantage by acting not in accordance with what's really going on? Yeah, we're still... Most of us are still playing by the rules, even though our opponents ha are changing the rule book. And uh, people need to, to wake up to the fact that because uh, the, the whole situation has changed, the worm has turned, basically, we've got to recognize that although we, we are still showing restraint, we are closer to civil war in this country than we've been in, what, 150 years. Uh, we're, we're in a situation that's analogous to the situation in the United States in the 1850s, where everyone could see what's coming. Everyone uh, was still play, trying to play by the rules, but events were soon to overtake um, that whole situation. We're very close to that right now. And I think we're going to probably end up in a situation a lot like, unfortunately, the Spanish Civil War. And I may have mentioned to you before, I think people have studied the Spanish Civil War because it was a very messy situation. You had people uh, fighting against literally their own family members, not just neighbors across the street or um, people just across the state line, but literally people, it, it drove families apart. The division was so deep and it was a, a very messy situation. And we, and they ended up, um, with unfortunately a, a situation where the, there were, where you really couldn't win at all because the two sides that were fighting each other were communists on one side and fascists on the other. So no matter who won, you ended up with totalitarianism. Here, we've got a situation where states are pushing back against the federal government. They're trying to reassert their 10th Amendment rights, and the government doesn't want to hear anything about it. They, um, the, the only situation where I've seen where the, the federal government has backed down, uh, ironically, has been marijuana laws. 
where they've stopped trying to enforce federal laws because there was such massive non-compliance that they realized that they, they could no longer enforce the law. And I think that sort of situation is going to play itself out over and over again with other bodies of law. That's the, 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 the kind of situation we're in. If there's going to be a lot of pushback. Things are going to get ugly. Uh, we may end up with a national divorce like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene has suggested. But uh, at this point, I think the system is so irrevocably broken, the political process is no longer trustworthy. The voting machines can't be trusted. So no individual election at any level of government can no longer be relied upon as being legitimate. <laughs> and talk about pushback. You have another situation like we had two years ago take place. That really could be the trigger of a second civil war in this country. And we've seen examples of that flaring up uh, in places around the world. Brazil is one, Australia, Austria, France. There have been enormous protests of a scale that we haven't seen um, in some time uh, happening. And it seems to be happening with increasing frequency um, by populaces that feel they have been disenfranchised. And, the, and as you had said earlier in this interview, where the trusted leaders, the public servants, are not acting with the people's best interests at heart, um, could you expand on um, strategies that people should start now if they haven't already to move forward in that environment? Sure. Well, uh, and I have to agree about Australia. And you could also look at what's going on right now in Brazil and also what's going on in uh, the Netherlands and Belgium with farmers strikes and protests. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Obviously, we're entering very perilous times, and it's in everyone's best interest to try to become as self-sufficient as possible, because the infrastructure is likely to crumble, or it's going to be denied to entire groups and blocks of people for political reasons. We're going to see economic warfare going on, even if we don't see civil war, we're going to see uh, federal dollars cut off from states that push back against the federal government. We're going to see um, all sorts of shenanigans going on with trade. So obviously, so if you think we've seen supply chain disruptions just with the recent unpleasantness of the of the pandemic, just wait until uh, your state government falls into disfavor with the federal government. They could get very ugly very quickly. And at, at that point, if supply chains are disrupted, we're going to be in what I refer to as yo-yo time. You're on your own. So we're going to have to fall back on local barter networks and literally what we have saved up in terms of food storage. I'm glad you brought up the word barter because I wanted to go there too. Uh, what you're talking about is a return to what works when you don't have a, a far-flung global supply chain. We've been so a little bit too smart for our britches for the past 40 years or so with just-in-time and offshoring and stretching out production, moving production to where the costs were the lowest or where you could pollute the cheapest or whatever. And now we're finding that, oh, dang, when, the, when you have a thousand ships waiting to get into long beach to unload uh, then you can't get any manufactured goods or when the the trains aren't rolling you can't get any fresh produce and all this sort of thing so that whole idea of uh, long supply chains is is we've seen how how our standard of living can immediately be impacted and drop when that get dis gets disrupted we've interviewed steve san angelo from the srs rocco report about that about the fragility of overextended supply chains of late stage empires and how that usually spells the end for those empires. Can you talk to us about bartering? Because people who are waking up from this, this slumber we've been put in for a couple generations now uh, are needing to rediscover how to even function effectively 
in a local community to get the things they need to live and to help each other out. And one of the questions that's so telling in that regards involves, like, for example, having old silver dimes and quarters for bartering purposes. And people say, well, if I buy uh, precious metals and I can't use them at the grocery store, how do you get rid of them? So if you could kind of unpack that concept for us and what it reveals as far as how much we've forgotten about how people always have known how to get by. Well, for many years in Survival Blog, I've stressed the importance of small silver versus gold for investors. Unless you are in a situation where you see the need to flee the country, where you need an incredibly compact form of wealth, where uh, colored gemstones, diamonds, gold, or platinum would be more appropriate. For everyone else, in every other situation, silver makes the most sense. Gold is too compact a form of wealth for practical barter, as I've discussed with you before. So small silver is where you need to be. And uh, in the event that we have an economic collapse, things will sort themselves out very quickly. We'll have price discovery on silver within not just weeks, but within days, where people will very quickly adapt and figure out exactly what silver is worth. So I do recommend for most of the folks listening to us right now, unless you have a offshore retreat and plans to go there, don't put your money in gold or platinum, put your money in silver and diversify far beyond just silver. You need to think in terms of practical, tangible items that are fungible, which means one is like every other where you can use them for, for barter. And my favorite there is common caliber ammunition. And I believe I alluded to that in one of my previous interviews with you. Yeah, I think you said like 22 long rifle is pretty good for uh, <laughs> pretty good uh, currency for barter exchange. And, and it's also incredibly compact. You know, 500 round box of 22 long rifle is only seven inches long by four inches square. 500 rounds of 12-gauge shotgun shells is almost as big as my desk. So it's it's a 22 long rifle actually is a, an excellent item to keep on hand. It has a long shelf life. As long as you keep it dry in a sealed container, uh, that priming is not going to go bad. It, your kids or even your grandkids will be able to shoot that ammunition just fine. So do stock up on common caliber ammunition. And then for your food storage, the most efficient way to buy food is in large containers. But think ahead in terms of how you are going to barter that food to exchange for other foods you might need or other necessities, cleaning supplies, gasoline, or whatever you're going to trade for. <laughs> it's important to have a really large quantity of Ziploc bags of different sizes. So that as you go to barter a five gallon or seven gallon bucket of hard red winter wheat or beans or rice or whatever, you have to have smaller, con smaller containers w to transport and trade with. So stock up very, very heavily on Ziploc bags all the way from sandwich size to two gallon size. The role of, uh, so many of these barter goods that people probably don't traditionally did have now more recently don't have, but should uh, acquire and have on hand. Um, there's so many aspects to that as far as shelf life, uh, versatility, that sort of thing. Um, and that one that sometimes is overlooked, uh, but has been brought up when we talk about the for versatility standpoint is like even hard liquor, even for people who never touch the stuff, so to speak, having something that can serve as a disinfectant, as a fuel, as on and on and on it goes. Uh, right. And, and for them, I, I recommend Everclear. It's actually made in two different grades. It's essentially medicinal alcohol. It's pure alcohol. It doesn't have any real taste to it at all. It's a lot like vodka, but even more pure and even higher proof. So you can pour that into a Bunsen burner and use it for fuel. You can use it for sterilizing medical instruments. You can use it at, for mixing with herbs to make tinctures. So it's multi-purpose um, and it's available 
it's not you don't normally see it on the shelf, but you can ask your local liquor store to order you a case of it. <laughs> or if you live in a state with the state liquor stores, even those stores are willing to order it for you. Again, it's called Everclear. Um, and there's a couple of other brands on the market that's basically the same stuff. But um, I think that's the ideal thing to keep on hand, especially for people who don't drink on a regular basis. A few moments ago, you were talking about barter and small silver, and that was just on the heels of us talking about the potential for a national divorce or a, or a separatism, that sort of thing. Um, what about states that are taking the bull by the horns in establishing either legal tender laws, uh, that sort of thing? Do you, do you think there's any uh, signs of hope or signs of real promise on the, on the horizon here from states? It, it being actually things just as simple as removing the tax issue from precious metals transactions was the, the basic first step. And it was Utah that started that. Uh, and a lot of other states have, have are following suit. And now states are talking about having a reserve of at least states that have a, a budget surplus. They're putting part of that surplus in precious metals. And that's very commendable. At some point, I would I can foresee that states are going to be issuing a state currency that's either a precious metal in a divisible unit or a paper currency that's 100 percent backed by precious metals. Uh, that's almost inevitable as well. So. The, the handwriting is really on the wall for the Federal Reserve note. It's it's a, a fiat currency. Many of your guests over the last few years have gone into that in excruciating detail, so I won't repeat it all here. But the dollar, as we know it, is doomed. And one of the wonderful fictions that we live under in our modern society is calling Federal Reserve notes dollars. They really aren't. And that whole fiction is going to fall apart at some point. And when it does, either local barter, uh, traditional precious metals in the form of pre-1965, dimes, quarters, half dollars, and silver dollars will kick back in. And I'm hopeful that some state governments, and we're already starting to see rumblings about this, will go ahead and issue a state currency. That's the the the... Dolce et decorum s the sweet and fitting ending to all of this. One more potential sign of hope that I wanted to explore with you is uh, firearms rights, uh, CCW reciprocity increasing, etc. When my wife and I got our CCW permits about 10 years ago, uh, there were uh, several states, but but not most that where we could have reciprocity with. The map has, in my limited view of it, uh, appeared to get more and more cooperation going on between states as far as and even states where it's not even concealed carry it's open carry it's just like you know any any resident or non-resident 21 years old over in kentucky that sort of thing uh is there a trend there that you see and you think is constructive absolutely uh, freedom is on the march with firearms freedom if you look at the bruin decision and also the epa decision it's clear that a lot of federal firearms laws are going to have to be rolled back and uh, the the march of freedom includes the advent of not just non-discretionary um, permits where uh, you have to show just cause to get a permit. That's basically gone with the Bruin decision. And above and beyond that, above and beyond uh, being able to get a permit from the state, there are now 25 states they have permitless concealed quick carry. It's soon to be 26, as I believe it's North Carolina joins the group, and Florida is right on the cusp of it. So we'll soon have 26 or 27 states with permitless concealed carry, which is off, uh, commonly called constitutional carry. It's I live in one of those states, and it's very encouraging to know that there's no permit required. You can carry a gun on your hip openly or concealed, in your vehicle, and of course, keep it in your home with no permit whatsoever required. And that's the way it really should be. 
So freedom really is on the march in that regard. Now, we might have some dictatorial government come along and, um, you know, try to, to pack the Supreme Court or something like that to overturn these decisions. But at least for now, things are very encouraging at the um, at the federal level with the recent Supreme Court decisions. And I hope we'll see more of that. And a, a lot of firearms laws are going to be challenged because of the Bruin decision. Another thing that was hopeful to us was when we got our CCW permits and we went to actually get photographs and pick up the cards and so on at the sheriff's office, the sheriff's deputy and the, the sheriff whom I had interviewed as well uh, were very, very supportive of this entire movement. And I guess, can you touch a base with us on the role that you see sheriffs being able to step into here in the face of so many other uh, public servants not acting in the best of people's interests? Well, absolutely. The, um, the fundamental building block of American society is county government. And the sheriff who's elected is the law of the land for that county. And thankfully, at least in the rural states, the majority of sheriffs who have been elected are constitutionalists. And I think we can count on the majority of them to stand up and do the right thing in the event that the federal government attempts any great overreach. So we should support our local police, our local sheriff's departments, and encourage our county sheriffs to do the right thing in regard to the 10th Amendment, the Second Amendment, and all the other amendments, you know, First First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and so on. Uh, encourage them to do the right thing and remind them that they took an oath, oath of office to the, con to the Constitution and that they're accountable to the taxpayers and citizens and voters of their own county and that they should think twice about blindly following any edict that comes down from the state government or the federal government. Well, we're going to want to stay in closer touch, I think, as things are rolling faster and faster, it seems, uh, here, and uh, would be grateful for your presence again with us. Remind people where they can go to get more information on many of these topics that we've discussed with you. Again, my website is survivalblog.com, just the way it sounds. And again, please dig into those archives. They're all free for the taking. We've been speaking with James Rawls. He is the founder of survivalblog.com. James, thanks for joining us again here on Liberty and Finance. God bless you and your listeners. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, Simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH, or electronic check money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.